biblical. Biblical is a loaded term in the Christian faith. What does it mean to be biblical? I, I was raised in the Methodist church. Or I should say I was raised uh, in vacation Bible schools during the summers in Greensboro, Georgia, where I would spend several weeks with my grandparents in the Piney Woods on Lake Oconee. It was at those vacation Bible schools and Sunday school on Sunday morning that I was first introduced to life in the Methodist church. It wasn't until I was in the third grade that uh, I would come home from school and, and tell my parents that, you know, they have churches here where we live too. <laughs> they felt pretty puny. And I said, they have donuts and, and the kids play games. It sounds like a lot of fun. Could, could we go? And of course, we went and found the local Methodist church near our home, Martin UMC in Bedford. And I was uh, in love with church. I, I loved Sunday school. I loved learning about the Bible. I, I loved youth group and the awkward teenage conversations. I loved swinging a hammer on mission trips. And I, and I fell in love with Jesus through those acts of service and, and through simply understanding God's love by the way that that community loved me. But what I had is something that I call an inherited faith. Maybe you've had this or still have this in your life today. It's that faith that we're handed by someone who loves us, maybe a parent or a grandparent, as in my case. And there's nothing inherently wrong with an inherited faith, but our prayer is that um, our kids would make their faith their own, right? And maybe the inherited faith you were handed was not something that was healthy for you. In fact, it could very well have been harmful. I know that's all too common. And so then when I was in college and young adulthood, I went through a process that I know many of us have engaged in as well. We call it here at Arapahoe deconstruction and reconstruction, where you ask, is this really my faith or just the faith that I was handed? If I'm a Christian, what kind of Christian do I want to be? And we begin to tear it apart like a block of, or a tower of Jenga blocks and begin to put it back together. And sometimes what we build back is similar to what we had before, and sometimes it is radically different. What does it mean to be biblical? When I was going through this reconstruction phase in, in my life, it was in those college years, and there were a lot of churches where I went to college that were happy to help me uh, build my faith up and to build up a biblical faith, they said. And maybe it was important to me to take the Bible seriously because um, I was so in love with literature at that time as well, and, and, and I need a holy text to guide me in my faith practice. Um, so I was drawn to that term, okay, I want to go in and have a faith that, that engages the Bible and takes it seriously, but what I came to find out was that term was a loaded one, and that the meaning of biblical was very specific and it didn't just mean engaging the Bible and taking it seriously. It meant reading the Bible a very specific way. And that word has in many ways become co-opted uh, by some within our American culture to mean something that I don't think it has to mean. In fact, I believe that today I'm a biblical pastor, a biblical Christian. I believe at Arapaho, we are a biblical church. It just comes down to how we see the Bible, how we understand it, how we hold it, how we allow it to hold us. So today, I want us to talk about the Bible, because we're beginning this new sermon series called Resurrecting Faith, and we're looking at how there are moments in our lives, and perhaps you've had a moment like this, where you realize that your faith is dying or dead, or you're just questioning a lot, those foundation-shaking questions, and you don't want to just go back to the faith that you had before. You're not asking God to just breathe life back into that. You're asking for something different, something new, tr something transformative. And for a lot of us, what we, what we don't want to take with us from our past is, is an understanding of the Bible that was hard harmful or unhelpful. So then the question becomes, how does the Bible fit into our faith moving forward? How do we take it seriously? Do we need to take it seriously? Is it central to our faith? Now, I'm going to spoil the ending, but I believe that it is. I believe the Bible can and should be, was intended to be a wellspring of life, our center pole, our, our guide in our Christian faith. But we have to understand what the Bible is and more importantly, even what the Bible is not. So let's talk about the Bible today and what it means uh, to me and what it means in the Methodist church to have a biblical faith. My name is Scott Gilliland, and I'm the senior pastor here at Arapahoe UMC, and I want to welcome you to worship. If you're joining us in the moment on our live stream on Sunday morning, or if you're watching this five years from now, I know that's the gift of online ministry, that there are people watching this right now in 2026. Hello, future. 
Um, and one of the gifts of online ministry is that as a visitor, folks can see sermons that pertain to topics that they find interesting that happened years ago. And I have a feeling that as folks visit our church, they may be curious about how we understand the Bible. I know this because of the messages I receive from visitors who find our brand of ministry so refreshing and yet open up about some of the baggage they have from the faith that they're leaving behind. And a lot of that has to do with a weaponized Bible and the way that it brought shame and guilt into their lives. So I'm hoping that this could be an illuminating sermon, not just for those watching right now, but for those who are watching in the future as well. Some of this isn't going to be new information for folks that have called Arapaho home for quite a while, um, but I pray that this is a helpful message um, for all of us this morning. Let's start by talking about what the Bible is not. I don't have the best memory. Um, folks that love me can tell you that. Folks that have been working with me for the last nine months can certainly tell you that. I'm actually quite forgetful, but I do remember distinctly uh, the first time that I held a Harry Potter book in my hands. It was in the fifth or sixth grade, standing in a bookstore with my grandparents over in Greensboro, Georgia, looking at a tower of brand new books, all with the same bright, colorful cover. The second book had just been released but it was the first time that I had read the name Harry Potter. And I begged and begged my grandparents to let me buy a copy, but my, my grandmother, God bless her, she was raised in Mississippi, and she was a good God-fearing Methodist, and she read the back of that cover talking about witches and wizards, and she said, Scott, I don't know if your mama wants you reading this book. And so she called my mom, and my mom said, um, my son wants to read a book? Yes, please, buy him three copies, right? So I, uh, that began my decade-long plunge into the world of Hogwarts and Harry and Ron and Hermione. And the books taught me so many things, the value of friendship, the importance of standing up for what you believe in, the, the dangers of racism, the power of hope in a hopeless world. The books taught me a lot of good things, and if you're a fan, I, I imagine they taught you as well. But never once does J.K. Rowling, in her thousands of pages and millions of words, never once does she ask us to believe that Harry is anything other than a fictional boy with a lightning scar on his forehead. She certainly would never ask us to believe that Harry Potter could redeem the world. And yet here in the Gospel of John, Jesus is making the opposite claim. He's very clear that the Bible is not simply a collection of good stories. It's not simply a historical text chronicling the Israelite people. No, according to Jesus, when seen correctly, the Bible is God's way of revealing who Jesus is as a Savior of the world. And the Father who sent me, he says, has himself testified on my behalf. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. When we try to reduce the Bible into a collection of, of moralistic stories or platitudes that are primarily meant to teach us something, then we forfeit the primary purpose of Scripture. Scripture is meant to reveal the heart of God, first and foremost. And while the perfect image of God is found in the person of Jesus, that's not just limited to the New Testament, but as far back as the books of Moses, Christ says, including Genesis. It's why in other portions of the Gospels, Jesus reminds us that he is the fulfillment of the law, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, meaning that his presence is simply the fullness of God's love found in even the earliest moments of Scripture. The Bible is more than simply a book to be studied, and I love Bible study. It's more than great literature and proverbial wisdom and moral imperatives, though that certainly is found within these pages. The Bible is the inspired words of God. More on that in a second. A God-breathed text that points us in the direction of Christ, re revealing Christ's identity at every corner, at every turn, in every act of love and justice found within. It's a testimony to the very heart of God. So the Bible is more than a book to be studied, but it's also not an idol to be worshipped. Let's talk about that. What's a movie that you are always in the mood to watch? If you're watching right now on our stream, type that, type that movie in the chat. What's a movie that you are always in the mood to watch? 
For me, one of the movies is Braveheart. And I, I know Braveheart is cheesy. It's not historically accurate. Mel Gibson has a problematic personal history. But I love Braveheart. It is a movie's movie. It is epic. It is melodramatic. There's great battle sequences. And if you haven't seen it, spoiler alert, it's been about 30 years. So I don't know. I guess try to skip ahead in the sermon or something. But in the movie, Mel Gibson plays William Wallace, the Scottish rebel warrior who leads a revolt revolt against Edward Longshanks for Scottish freedom. And there's this one scene that always gives me chills. It's the scene, right? The iconic scene where he's got the blue paint on his face, and he's delivering the speech to all of the men before they go into their first real big battle against England. It's the first time most of the Scottish men have been around each other, the first time they've assembled an army like this, and the legend of this great warrior, William Wallace, has begun to spread. And William tries to get the men's attention because he knows most of them simply want to play it safe and receive whatever negotiation the English are willing to hand over. But, but William wants them to fight because he knows that it's the only real path to freedom that they have. And so he says, sons of Scotland, I'm not even going to attempt the accent, it would be a train wreck, I'm William Wallace. To which one of the soldiers cries out, William Wallace is seven feet tall. Yes, says William. I've heard. He kills men by the hundreds, and if he were here, he'd consume the English with fireballs from his eyes and bolts of lightning from his... The legend of William Wallace had grown to the point that the men could not see him for who he truly was. And the irony is, for all the fantastic stories they had put their faith in, the real power of William Wallace was never in lightning bolts or fireballs or superhuman height, but rather in his courage, his tenacity, his passion for delivering freedom for the Scottish people. Jesus is running into the same issue with the religious leaders in this passage of Scripture. They know the stories they have been handed down through the generations. But when the Messiah is standing right in front of them, they refuse to acknowledge who he is. They want to stay safe, clinging to their scrolls, but they ignore the fact that those scrolls will not save them. The scrolls won't deliver them to freedom. The only one who has the power to do that is the seemingly unimpressive man standing before them. But I don't think the religious scholars in Jesus' day are the only ones who do this. I think we're all guilty at times of placing more faith in our Bibles, in our certainty, in an unmoving text than we do in Jesus. What do I mean by that? Well, the Bible is an incredibly malleable thing. It can be bent and twisted to say or mean just about anything that I want it to. We can open up our Bibles and find any number of verses that will support us in whatever preconceived notions that cross our minds, even the really bad, even evil stuff. Do you want to support gender inequality? Use the Bible. How about slavery? Sure, the Bible can do that. What about polygamy or racism or child abuse? Yep, all of those can be found as cherry-picked verses from the Bible. And for the record, everybody cherry-picks. Sometimes it's just the question of what you pick. Anyways, the Bible can, even in the most extreme cases, be bent towards our wills, even and especially at our most sinful. But even though I can twist and turn the Bible to match my will, God is not so easily swayed. That's the power that we find in a relationship with Jesus Christ that is born out of Scripture, yes, but does not end there. The religious scholars are in love with their text, but we are called to be in love with God. And while the Bible is a beautiful book that can lead us to know who Jesus is, if it begins to occupy the space of worship that is reserved for Jesus, the Bible very literally becomes an idol. Listen to the words of Jesus. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that testify on my behalf, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. When we idolize the Bible, we suck the life right out of it because we have taken a living, breathing, relational presence of God out of it. If we read the Bible and leave its pages without feeling as though a conversation has taken place, if we've not bothered to find ourselves in this story, 
if we've not searched the words for a clearer picture of who God, who Jesus is in our lives, then we must begin again because we have not read the Bible. The truth is John's gospel reminds us that the Word of God The capital W word of God is Christ, and no text, no matter how holy, even the lowercase w words of God, nothing can replace the real presence of God with us. So my friends, lower the Bible just a bit, just enough for Christ to resume his place as the object of our praise. In our effort to respect and revere the words of God, we must never confuse them with the word of God. So the Bible is more than a book to be studied, but it's also not an idol to be worshipped. And so how can the Bible help us to resurrect our faith? How can it prove to be central in our search for life with a living God? Let's talk about a few key things as we seek to make our holy text a healthy center for our spiritual lives. Number one, the Bible is God-breathed and open. What do I mean by that? It all has to do with three really important words when we're talking about how to understand Scripture. Inspired, inerrant, and infallible. If you don't know what those terms mean, let me define them real quick. Inspired means that we believe that Scripture is God-breathed, God-inspired, that, that the words found here were inspired by God's Spirit, guided by God's presence, but not ultimately every single word written by God's hand. These are words written by human people, and human people are imperfect. So it imperfectly captures the heart of God, but it captures the heart of God nevertheless. Inspired. In the Methodist Church, we believe the Bible is inspired, God breathed, but we don't believe it's inerrant or infallible. Inerrant means it's without error, no imperfections, perfect, exactly the way it is, every word, exactly the way it was intended, every comma placed where it needs to be, even though there's no punctuation in biblical Greek or Hebrew. Anyways, uh, there's also the word infallible, which means without error as it pertains only to faith and faithful living, which basically is inerrant, but maybe they got some dates and times wrong. We don't believe the Bible is inerrant or infallible. We don't believe that this Bible is without error, even though it does capture the heart of God. That's important because once you believe the Bible is inerrant or infallible, it quickly leads you to the American phenomenon of biblical literalism. And maybe this is a tradition you were raised in where we read the Bible exactly as it is and we try to bring it into our life precisely today without any changes whatsoever. The Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. The problem is we've we've been told, we've been given the impression that biblical literalism is somehow like the traditional orthodox way to read the Bible, when that is nothing, that's not true. It it is an American phenomenon. Biblical literalism is a relatively new way to understand the Bible, about a hundred years old. Ever since the Scriptures were written, the Apostle Paul didn't read the Bible as literal. Jesus didn't read the Hebrew text as literal. The Bible has always been open to interpretation. Since ever, it was, since ever it has existed. And so is it holy? Yes. Is it the primary way we understand God and faith? Yes. But is it a perfect book with no errors whatsoever? Is it a text that we can apply directly one-to-one into our lives today? No. And that has been the prevailing consistent view for as long as it has existed. The Bible is God-breathed and open. Secondly, as we seek to make this the center of our of our faith. Find yourself in the story. Find yourself in the story. A lot of times people want to know how the Bible fits into their life. How does it apply to my life, we say. But one of my professors, Dr. Heller, he's the professor of Old Testament at SMU seminary that I went to. He said that instead of asking how we can apply the Bible to our lives, we ought to ask how often we ought to ask how we can apply our lives to the Bible. Rather than applying the Bible to our lives, how can we apply our lives to the Bible? That distinction is subtle but significant. You know, we live in a consumerist culture that pushes us into this very selfish, natural position in life. And over the last few decades, this selfish, consumer-driven American culture has slowly filtered into our American churches, and now we call looking for a church to attend church shopping, right? And when you ask a lot of Christians why they left their church, a common answer you get is, well, I just wasn't getting fed. A gift of the countercultural Christian faith is that it calls us to wake up and to realize that life is not about me, and the Bible is not about me either. 
American Christianity has tried to package it as a self-help book or a prescription for how to live a happy find those your life transformed by the power in these pages there's a lot more happening here as well and so I think Dr. Heller is right we do need to focus more on applying ourselves to the Bible rather than applying the Bible to ourselves and what does that look like in our daily spiritual practice of scripture reading I think it starts with finding ourselves in the story where are you in the creation story or in exodus or in the Psalms, or in the Gospels? Where is your heart found in the prayers of Paul? Where are your neighbors, or where are the people that you hate? Whose voice can you hear? Whose voice is missing? When are you not the hero? Where are the intersections between your story and the bigger story of God? How is your life woven into the larger tapestry of God? But it can go even deeper. Number three, Invite the Holy Spirit to read you. Invite the Holy Spirit to read you. As I said earlier, we cannot unlock the true power of Scripture as long as we treat it as either a great book to be studied or a stone tablet to be worshipped. What we take in our hands when we pick up to the Bible ought to be nothing short of the life of the living, breathing words of God that point us to the living, breathing word of God. But let me be clear, we do not get there on our own. This book is, in, is just that. It is a book. And when you take it on your own and independently read it for your own enjoyment, it can teach us a great many things or it could simply confirm all of our previously held beliefs. Both things are supremely possible. But the true power of Scripture is unlocked when we invite another living, breathing presence into our reading. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us when we read the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit, that presence of God with us in this moment is what lifts the words off of the pages and into our hearts. When we invite the Holy Spirit into the act of Scripture reading, we invite God's breath to breathe again in the pages, to orient us to its truth, to shine a light on something good that our soul or our world desperately needs. If we try to read the scriptures without the Holy Spirit's guidance, we can find a great many things, but we may struggle to see Christ in these pages. It's only with God's presence that the fullness of who God is can be revealed to us. So what does it mean to be biblical? I think it starts with understanding what the Bible is and is not. It's more than a book to be studied, but it's less than an idol to be worshipped. It's God-breathed, but it's far from perfect. It's a story in which we can find ourselves a text that can also read us. And when partnered with the Holy Spirit, it reveals the real presence of Christ and the very heart of God. May it be the gift that it was intended to be. May it guide us towards a resurrected faith. Amen.